All right, welcome back. Um, let me just project the nodes. We've been talking about how, as leaders, we must develop the ability to, uh, you know, to preach and teach the word of God. Uh, so we're here ministering healing, right? So as leaders, uh, we must develop the ability to minister healing uh, because people are going to come to us, ask for prayer requests. They're going to say, hey, you know, going through this sickness, I'm going through this challenge, healing in the body. Uh, and, and, and so we must be well prepared, right? And we must understand that it is God's will to heal everyone sick. Uh, and the, the different there are different ways through which God can heal. Right? So sometimes, you know, usually in uh, rural areas when we go on missions and, uh, you know, they, they come with a, maybe a glass of water, they come with a bottle of oil and say, hey, can you pray for this? Uh, and then I will, you know, put it on the person who's unwell so that they can get healed. Uh, so be open to all of that because God, we, we don't say, no, that happened in the Old Testament, the New Testament. Now, in the early church, now it doesn't happen. No. Uh, be aware that God heals in different ways. Know how to teach God's word to build faith for healing. So, for example, as uh, leaders, uh, maybe in your cell group or uh, in your church, you've been assigned to preach about healing one Sunday. right? So, firstly, you teach on God's word. How God brought God, what does God say about healing? Then you can build it up to how the Lord Jesus healed people and build faith in their hearts, knowing that, you know, the same Holy Spirit that was in Jesus is in us. And uh, when we pray, God can, uh, you know, uh, heal people. And there's a gift of healing uh, and, and working on miracles. So you're building faith in them. And then you pray for healing. You know how to minister healing to the sick. So you just pray over them in the name of Jesus, uh, declare healing. You can, you know, uh, rebuke every spirit of infirmity uh, and pray for healing. Right? Then as leaders, we must also know how to minister deliverance. Now, for this, we must know how the devil operates. Right? We, can, we, you know, we talked about the mind, right? We talked about how uh, the different stages of uh, temptations which come right so one is it's it's a thought second becomes an argument and reasoning third it becomes imagination like as if you're actually involved in the sin and four it becomes a stronghold right so know how the devil operates and when we know it we'll be able to teach others hey this is what the devil does he puts a thought in our mind if that thought is not uh, rebuked or cancelled off uh, and goes on uh, to become an argument and a reasoning. Eventually, you'll begin to imagine about it, then it becomes a stronghold, and then, you know, uh, uh, it, it con continues to overpower us. So we are teaching people. Then we teach them that God is, you know, the authority of Christ, what Jesus did on the cross. And then you can preach from the word and say, you know, well, when Jesus was doing his ministry, there was this, uh, you know, for example, you can say there was this legion, this man possessed with demons. And legion is, uh, you know, thousands of demons in, in this person. But all Jesus said was, get out of that person. Right. So we saw the authority of Christ. We saw that uh, Jesus had authority over the devil, wherever he was. And the temptations came, even when he was fasting, he showed his authority. On the cross, he defeated the works of the enemy. So what are we doing? We are uh, stirring up the pe people's heart, saying, hey, you and I are seated together. You know, sometimes people may say, hey, that is Jesus. Jesus did it. What about us? Uh, when Jesus says, hey, you're seated with me in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that's where our authority is. We may be physically here, but in the spirit, you and I have authority. Then we talk about the, uh, the weapons that God has given us. Um, and so we're building faith. And then we know how to uh, minister deliverance to the oppressed and those who are possessed. Two things. What is oppression? Oppression is usually uh, in the mind, right? So um, uh, it happens when, you know, why is it that, you know, believers uh, feel suicidal? Believers feel, you know, they are 
uh, addicted to pornography or they're addicted to uh, alcohol. Why is it? Why is it? Because it's an oppression. Right? It's, it started off with a thought. It went on. It stayed there. It lingered there. And it's become a stronghold now. So we must know how to uh, pray for deliverance. Right? And then those who are possessed. Now, a believer cannot be possessed. Uh, so when you're ministering to people who are from other faiths, remember that they are possessed by demons that are operating uh, in, the, in this world. So how do you minister to them? You can learn about that, right? Be prepared. Uh, and, and so for all of this, you need to be prepared, right? Uh, remember many times uh, this has happened when usually we go on missions and uh, many, many years ago, this once happened, I was prepared in the word, what I had to teach. We were doing a couple of, uh, it was uh, a youth uh, meeting, I guess. We were doing the youth and, uh, and I was prepared in the word. But as I was teaching, there was this young man, a youth, who just began to, uh, you know, scream out and shout and all of that. It really took me off guard. I, I didn't know what do I do. I mean, I knew that I can pray uh, the Lord. I was just new in the faith, just learning about all these things. Um, but I just prayed. But that prayer was more of a prayer of, okay, uh, get me out of this situation prayer. Uh, then... As I you know, began to minister more, I realized that, hey, the devil is a defeated foe and you and I have authority, so we can stand in authority. We don't have to be afraid of these works of the devil, right? So when we go through it, we'll be able to teach it um, uh, to people as well you know, in your life groups, in your churches and ministries. And then we must develop the ability to for counseling right now. Uh, know how to counsel people in the word. Uh, know how to direct people in God's will and God's ways. Now, as leaders, one of the things that we always emphasize at APC is we will counsel you, but the decision is always yours. Never force people as leaders. Never force people under you to forcefully make those decisions. You have to do it. Only then God will listen to you. No. <clears throat> we counsel them. We give them the word, we tell them, this is what it is, this is what the word says, so this will be the right thing that you can do. And then you can prayerfully see what God is leading you towards. Remember, you have the Holy Spirit inside you, you can always ask the Holy Spirit. You can ask God for guidance, He will give you guidance. He can speak to you through a vision, dream, or through the word, through the knowing in your spirit, different ways. Right. So when you're counseling, we must know how to counsel people in the word right, and the ways of God. Right, any questions? Any questions? Oh, we, everyone able to follow? Yes, Christopher, please go ahead. Mm, yeah. Yes, uh, yes uh, Pastor, I just wanted to find out, um, or rather, uh, my question was really about uh, you know, when ministering uh, uh, deliverance, and um, there may be times when, uh, uh, there could be times when you know when it's you know it's not actually uh, having having the right effect, mm. and the outcomes are not um, you know really what uh, one is expecting. Mm. Uh, so sometimes you know, like quieting of the spirit, or you know, the person mm. is in, a, in in this particular state of you know, I said screaming and. Mm -hmm. So um, I remember there is a Bible reference where uh, Jesus actually had to had to uh, I mean the, the the apostles were actually trying to do the deliverance and you know Jesus said that um, and they were not able to have that mm -hmm. effect so you know Jesus actually was able to do it and he said that you know that this that the I think he mentioned something about this this requires mm -hmm. fasting and mm -hmm. some more prayer or you know there were a few things that he mentioned. So, just wanted to know: um, Have you had had the, uh, have you encountered any situation like that? Mm. And um, you know how how was how did that actually um, you know uh, what was the outcome of that? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. That's fine. Yes. Uh, so Jesus says the you know, disciples tried to uh, uh, you know uh, try to exercise 
demon possessed person and jesus says this would come through fasting and prayer now basically what it was was if you see the context basically jesus is saying that you know you need to be you know, so we must understand that the holy spirit was not yet uh, upon these disciples right uh, so jesus was trying to get them to understand that these are you're, you're fighting against you know flesh not flesh and blood but spiritualities and powers of darkness so um, fasting and prayer is something that is required right and now we understand it but the disciples may not have understood you know the uh, um, you know weapons of our warfare and uh, uh, things that the devil is doing they may not have understood all those technical terms so um yes fasting and prayer is very important right uh to pray and to uh, what does it do it just empowers us uh, so yes i can give you a couple of uh, instances uh, there was this one time we were in a different state and uh spraying this all of a sudden this person started to manifest started screaming and shouting and saying i'm going to you know destroy your life i'm going to uh, you know just um, he started breaking the legs of the chair uh, just with his bare hands you know uh, and he punched a hole into the wall this was hard uh, it's not a plastic wall it's a, it was a stone wall and uh, you know there were five six people trying to hold on to him but he would just push them away with ease uh, and I was just, I had just gone there to do one conference, right, just to teach a couple of sessions. I was not ready for all of this. Uh, but as he said, Christopher, I, it it did, it did cause some kind of a fear inside because I'm seeing this and saying, oh, man, what do I do? Um, so yes, I, I just prayed, but it didn't really have much effect, right? Uh, now, I'm not saying that because I was... Uh, you know, the power of Jesus was not there, not that. Uh, I did pray. I did, uh, you know, we as a team, there were a few of us there. We all gathered around him, tried, we prayed, we ca tried casting it out. Uh, but nothing really happened, right? Nothing really happened. Uh, but it got me thinking when I went back home, it got me thinking, why? Why? Because the Lord Jesus is all powerful. We prayed right. We did it right. Um, you know, uh, but I realized that I, that after that whole ordeal, I was like, you see the enemy, yes, he's a defeated foe, but he's still, uh, you know, powerful in terms of what he can do here on earth. So that's, it helped me realize that, hey, I need to do so much. I need to grow so much more in my faith, so much more. I need so much more of the anointing of God to overcome these things, right? Um, yes, so Christopher, there were times, especially the first two times, uh, you know, I prayed and, um, you know, I came back very discouraged, nothing happened. Uh, but over time, uh, I started to realize that, hey, God is working. Right? And I, I realized that uh, I began to just take in that authority, understand the authority that I have in Christ uh, and the authority that the Holy Spirit inside me is greater. So I began to dwell on these kind of words. And uh, of course, there's a function of, you know, we know that God calls some into that kind of ministry, the deliverance ministry, uh, where God has anointed them for that cause. Uh, but then all of us, Right. It's not like I'm not in the deliverance ministry, choose somebody else. No, all of us have the authority to pray and cast out demons and uh, pray for those who are possessed and oppressed. Right. So basically, over time, uh, as we grow in the Lord, as we uh, spend more time in God's presence, but to see after that, after those initial two, three instances, uh, I began to look at it differently. Right. I said, okay, it's not me. I'm not fighting against this devil. It is the Holy Spirit. It is Jesus who's standing next to me. And so there was this kind of a boldness. Right? Initially, first two times, there was a, oh man, he punched a hole in the wall. Oh, he broke the chairs with his hands. So I was looking at what he was doing in the natural. But now, when I'm ministering to people, especially if they're possessed or oppressed, I don't look at the natural. He may punch the wall, he may jump off a five floor building and still be fine it doesn't matter because he was demonically energized but i look at the 
spiritual in the spiritual the moment you talk about the spiritual aspect and you and you know who you are in the spirit the enemy knows that right and you when you stand in authority the enemy knows so over time you know i realized hey let's not focus on what the devil is doing there he may be screaming shouting yelling hitting doing all those things but in the spiritual jesus is victorious Jesus's authority is greater than the authority of the devil. So you stand there in that authority. The natural, it looks this way. But in the spiritual, who's stronger? Jesus. You talk about the cross. You think, so especially when you are ministering, if you get an opportunity and there comes a time when you're ministering to somebody who's possessed or oppressed, uh, especially if they're jumping and screaming and shouting, uh, you know, uh, one is you do the practical of hey you tell them just be seated here you have some people be seated uh, if they are not it's all right still remember that you are you know you, you you know you're standing so you think about the cross think about what jesus has done for you and you know that jesus is there uh you know it changes the perspective on how you look at that situation and that that personally you know it helped me personally right because initially i was you know, so fearful, uh, or what is going to happen? Or think about. I used to think about what people will. What if this demon doesn't go? And then I'm teaching the word of God, and what will people think of me? All of that, I, I put it aside, and I said, God, this is what it is. You made a public spectacle of the devil. You, you have destroyed the works of the devil, and now you are with me, standing with me. So the the way you're looking at that situation, complete your attitude towards the situation completely changes. And so these are things that help me. Of course, uh, and when I know that I'm going to a place, for example, if, I'm, if I know I'm going to uh, uh, for a missions trip, I would spend probably you know a week uh, or so uh, in additional, whenever I can, spend more time in prayer because I know that these are things I'm going to face. So I'd be prepared in the spirit as well. And this is an additional prayer, additional, you know, maybe a couple of days of fasting and praying. Uh, these are things that can help. And uh, Christopher, I hope this helps you. Yes, uh, thank you, Pastor. I just want to follow a follow up question. This is on the ministry, uh, ministering of, of healing, mm. um, where, uh, um, you know, we are, we are, you know, we are praying for, you know, you know, healing the person, and um, uh, there's you know the outcome is not immediate, or it, you know it takes time. And um, as as this is continuing, or if there's another occasion to you know to minister healing, um, again you know the outcomes are not there. So I just mm -hmm. wanted to try and understand um, uh, while the while while ministering of the healing is done. Um, is there any indication of um, you know the outcomes of of this um, this of of actually healing the person uh, versus you know God's um, predestination of you know how what this person will actually eventually you know or not eventually but this, this predestination may um, may uh, you know uh, indicate that. Um, uh, that that person may not be healed, uh, and that person may say, for example, uh, you know, pass away. For example, so just want to try and understand that, you know, from from yeah. point of view of uh, you know, pre the predestination versus, uh, I mean, whether there's any indication of the of God's predestination in that in that particular case. Yeah, very very genuine uh, questions, Christopher, because these are things that I exactly the same thing, you know, uh, I went through initially. Uh, People come up for prayer, they wouldn't be healed. They would come up again a second time, or they would come. Other people would come up for prayer, wouldn't be healed. Some uh, there was a there was a certain phase where initially, you know, talking about fifteen odd years back, um, I stopped praying for healing. You you give me the word, I will teach a good, I will preach a good 20, 30 minute sermon if you'd like. Uh, pray for you if you need finances. All the other, uh, I would uh, people come up for prayer for healing and say, "Okay, God, thank you for healing," and just just move on. But uh, as we 
uh, as we just you know looked, uh, Christopher, we saw that healing is something that God, yeah, in this uh, the previous point, ministering healing, it is God's will to heal every person. So it's not like it is God's will to heal every person between twenty to sixty years old, or. 30 to 80 years old. After 80, it's not God's will. No. One, it is God's will to heal everyone. Right? So that should be established in our heart. First thing, God's will is to heal everyone. Now, we know that God uses different ways to heal. We know that there is age. There are things that, you know, we are living in a fallen world right now. And uh, there's age. Our bodies will go through the different things that we face uh, due to age. So we must accept that fact. But you know, there are times there will be. You know, it's not like somebody is 80 years old and is going through a terrible sickness. Uh, doesn't mean if we we should not pray. We we cannot say uh, no. Anyway, you're 80. No. So I think it's old age. It's okay. Many times I prayed for you know, last week at church. There was this uh, uh, elderly woman. She's seventy-five, and she said uh, she came up to me and she said, "You know, I'm having stomach pains. I'm having. I take a lot of medicines. My stomach burns." And uh, you know, immediately that thought came to me, maybe because of its old age. But then I rebuked that thought. And I said, "God, it's your desire to heal everyone." I said, "Auntie, let me pray for you." So I just prayed, God, just bring healing on this auntie. I know, you know, she's old. Uh, she's going through this pain. Bring healing. Uh, thank you for healing her. Thank you for removing every stomach burns uh, and and just restoring her. And she came up to me after you know we had lunch that day uh, on Sunday, and so we had lunch at church. We finished lunch, and she came up to me and she said, "I don't feel any stomach burn, even though I ate such a you know, spicy food." She said, I feel that God has healed me. I'm so happy. Right now, Christopher, the whole thing of predestination, uh, Ephesians 1, it, it is what we are predestined in Christ Jesus. So Paul is talking about not our predestination in terms of our life. This is what you're predestined for. When you're born, you will be born as born blind, and for the rest of your life, you will be blind. That is predestined. Right now, what Paul is talking about is predestined in Christ, which means what is it that we once we are in Christ, we have all of these blessings. Right? So we must understand that little bit of a difference there. God's will is to heal everyone. And God's will is that when we pray, we must be assured that God can bring healing. When it doesn't happen, we, I know it is discouraging. I know it feels like, you know, God, what is happening? But just because, I always say, just because God didn't heal, doesn't mean God is not the healer. He is the healer. If we continue to encourage the person and say, hey, continue to trust God. God can bring healing. This is who he is. Uh, even through the trials, through the difficulties, he is God. Uh, so, yes, uh, to answer, uh, even if you look at, uh, you know, I was reading about Fanny Crosby, the great, a songwriter who wrote 8,000 odd hymns, uh, who's blind. Um, and, you know, most of her songs is about looking at the beauty of Christ. Uh, uh, but uh, do, do you think people wouldn't have prayed for healing? Do you think that she would not have uh, desired to be, uh, you know, to see? And uh, But she didn't receive her healing. But it doesn't mean that, you know, God is not the healer. But what was it? Even in that blindness, God was glorified through it. Right. So, so one thing we must understand that God has His way, but God's desire is to heal everyone. That that is settled in our heart. So when we are praying for people, don't worry about uh, you know predestination, all of those things. Uh, what if a baby is you know a child may be born deformed? It's God's will to heal. heal, heal. Right? It's not like you're predestined for the rest of your life, you're uh, going to be deformed. And God can heal. Right? So, Christopher, I hope uh, that answers that question on the predestination part of it. Yeah. 
Okay, uh, we get into the next chapter. It's a very small chapter. Let's take about 10 minutes to finish that. Right. The next one is here. Uh, developing specific functional skills. Right? Uh, how do we develop the skills to be a successful cell leader? Now, this can be also translated to uh, your ministry or uh, even your church. Uh, some points may be repeated here. Keep learning continuously. We talked about it. Keep investing time and effort to learn, to grow, to develop, to uh, and and to achieve bigger things. Proverbs one five says, "A wise man will hear, will increase learning. A man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel." So the skills can be anything, right? One of the things that I am working on is, uh, I think I've shared this. Uh, I don't know if it's this class or the second years. Or the first years, I don't know, but uh, but I was talking to the student. I was share, sharing how I'm, you know, trying to learn how you know there are different skills involved in speaking uh, in public speaking, right? So, so as as a teacher, as a preacher, I know that I'm going to be on the you know pulpit teaching preaching. Uh, so I'm, more, I'm I'm learning on how to develop skills on being an effective uh, public speaker, right? Not not only the spiritual side, but also the practical things that are involved, our dressing sense, the way we speak, intonation, rate of speech, all these things. And uh, so keep learning continuously, keep developing. Five steps to establish a cycle of uh, learning. You've got the acronym first here. Uh, F for focus on your priorities, uh, identify your critical issues and development objectives. So you see where you can where you need to improve more and how you can develop in that. Implement something every day. Okay, stretch your comfort zone. So how you can keep learning, stretch your comfort zone. Uh, it could be reading. It could be spending more time in God's word. It could be spending more time in practical things, raising up leaders. Uh, stretch out of your comfort zone. Reflect on what happens. R for reflect. Uh, Extract maximum learning from your experiences. Now, your experiences is will teach you a lot. And I've got so much of experiences that I can share that I, you know, some of the silly mistakes that I've made, some of the places where I've done really well, and I, I take it. I say, okay, God, thank you. Uh, help me to better what I'm doing. And there are places where I've, uh, I, where I feel I'm not done better. I go back and say, okay, maybe I should have done this. Or some places where I have failed, uh, so go back. Okay, uh, maybe this is why it failed, or whatever I, the project that I took up, or whatever I'm doing. These are the reasons, maybe. And so you reflect on what happens and learn from those experiences, right? Seek feedback and support. Learn from either ideas and other perspectives, right? And uh, finally, transfer learning into next steps. Adapt and learn from continued learning. So this is the acronym for first. Uh, focus on your priorities. Implement something every day. That means stretch out of your comfort zone. Reflect on what happens. Learn from your past failures and successes. Now, don't dwell too much on your success. Don't dwell too much on the failures. Right? If you had a success previously, don't dwell too much on it. Uh, oh, see, I was, I was very successful last time. Yeah, that success story, good. You learn from it, you move on. Or don't look at your past and look at the failures and say, oh, I failed there. Maybe I may fail here now. And you look at your past success and failure and you learn from it. Right? And then seek feedback and support, transfer learning into next steps. Some specific skills to improve again. Ability to organize and coordinate the cell meetings. We talked about that as well. Now, a leader must be willing, to, must have the ability to organize, right? Set up probably rosters, uh, okay, prayer roster, prayer leading roster, um, uh, those who have to look after the children, a roster for them, preparing material for them, uh, organizing the flow of the cell meeting or the church. If you're doing additional outreaches, organizing the whole uh, outreach uh, can, outreach that you're doing, do regular follow-up, work with your cell pastor, 
uh, networking with other cell leaders. So we also talked about these things briefly, right? So I think we'll stop here. Uh, we'll pick up from next class. Uh, but before we close, do you have any thoughts, any questions that you'd like to share? Okay. All right. Uh, so we'll just uh, close in prayer. Uh, maybe one of us can please close. Any one of us can close in prayer, please. Go ahead. Asha, would you like to pray? Yes, Master. Go ahead. Dear God, thank you so much, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to learn about the Sapashi God. And Lord, I pray that as we learned about the developing the ability to minister to others, God, I pray that Lord, we, what we have learned, we just may not just hear it, but be the doers of what we have done, learned, God. Thank you so much, God, for the opportunity to learn how to disciple people and how to disciple mainly all the, the children you have put in your point pointed to us, God. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you're about to do in our lives. And thank you, Lord, for each one of them, God, as they go, may they reflect on what they have learned and think and ponder about it, God, that they will meditate, Lord, what it is to disciple, what it is to take this um, thing in a way that is in a serious manner and not a way that they is casual, God, but may they understand the deeper level of what they have been learned, God. Thank you, Lord, for each one of them, that they'll have a great day. Amen. 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 Thank you, Asha. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Have a wonderful week ahead. I'll see you next week. God bless you all. Thank you, Asha. Thank you.